Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Monica Ilieprica, and you're watching Observers to the European Parliament, the Europe of Tomorrow, broadcast by the Romanian Public Television, live exclusively online on the Facebook page of TVR1, the YouTube channel of TVR, the Instagram account of TVR1, and on the TVR Plus platform. Today we'll be discussing several topics that are on the agenda of the Conference on the Future of Europe. And these are education, migration, European democracy and digital transformation. Allow me now to introduce my distinguished guests. Joining us online are Frank Stadelmeier, Senior Manager Civica, Sciences Po, Deputy Director of the Centre for Europe. Good afternoon and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Ioana Melenciuk, lecturer, director of the Department of International Relations and European Integration from the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration, also known as SNSPA. Good afternoon and thank you for being with us today. Good afternoon and thank you for, uh, for having me here. Monica Jitaranu, Senior Manager Civica, Central European University Global Partnerships Officer. Good afternoon and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. And here in Studio 4 is Mr. Victor Negrescu, member of the European Parliament from the SND Group, Vice Chair of the Committee on Culture and Education. Good afternoon and thank you very much for being with us today. Good afternoon and thank you for the invitation. I propose we start the debate with a topic that is not on the agenda of the conference on the future of Europe, but it is of great importance these days, and that is the situation in Ukraine. Mr. Negrescu, you made a speech about the deterioration of the situation of refugees in Ukraine as a consequence of Russia's aggression. You created a special humanitarian corridor for Ukraine, and your colleagues supported your initiative. What are the results? First of all, I think it's important to discuss about Ukraine today. And Ukraine, the Ukrainian situation is very much linked with the future of Europe. This is why in the format of the Conference for the Future of Europe, we decided to invite Ukrainian citizens to speak with us. Because, of course, if we speak about the evolution of the European project, we also have to think about citizens that do not live in the European Union and to find ways to interact with them. But, of course, we are currently in a crisis. We have a war in Ukraine. And of course, we have to find means to support Ukraine, but also support the refugees that are coming from there. So we speak about millions of people and millions of children as well. Among them, of course, we also have students, we also have professors. And this is very much linked, again, with what European universities are doing. This is why, first of all, I said and I proposed this idea of creating a humanitarian corridor to enable, again, refugees to, to, to reach Europe faster, while in the same time uh, providing an adequate support on the short term, but also on the long term. And of course, uh, I promote this idea of a humanitarian corridor. This is, was widely supported by my colleagues in the European Parliament, was after that taken on board by the Commission that came in with a very interesting proposal, creating a specific temporary mechanism to support refugees. But also we are moving forward on that. And we made this very precise proposal to allow refugees to get access to education. And this is very much linked, again, with students and professors, get access to healthcare and get access to, to, to social support. So those three dimensions are essential. They go in line again with the concept and the evolution of the European project. And I believe, of course, that uh, we have to provide an adequate support uh, to refugees and show that we are there for Ukraine and Ukrainian citizens in these difficult times. What is the current situation of Romania, Romanian and other EU citizens who are still in Ukraine? How can the European Union help them? I think it's also important to understand that uh, Ukraine is a multicultural country and of course we have uh, minorities fr fr from different countries living there. Of course we have Romanians, uh, my, a Romanian, strong Romanian minority present there. This is why uh, I, I also called upon European institutions to consider them as being also uh, European citizens in providing adequate support to, to all of them. So we work with the Ukrainian authorities in this regard uh, to support all, uh, all Ukrainian citizens independently of course of their of their any group, but also we, we have to understand this uh, multicultural diversity. So this is why, of course, uh, of course, the integrated support should be uh, should be broader. So uh, we identify, uh, and this was recently approved in the European Parliament, actually this week, uh, the possibility to uh, flexibilize uh, European funding allocated again uh, for countries in the neighborhood of Ukraine, but also uh, the EU funding uh, provided to. Uh, to structures and partners from Ukraine, 
uh, this is the way to go. We need to provide support. Financial means are essential in this regard. And of course, in this line, it's important again to involve all stakeholders that want to be involved and that have been involved in the last couple of, uh, of weeks. And there, of course, we have NGOs, we have local communities, we have social partners, we have universities that really shown a, a lot of support. And for instance, we have universities like Senesepar here in, in, in Romania that is welcoming refugees. Uh, so we have children that are now in, 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 in living in the, let's say, building that Senesepar has. We provide uh, um, help for them, we provide food, we provide support. This is very important. And I know universities across Europe are doing that, and this is why funding is essential to deal with all those challenges. Thank you. Mr. Stadelmeier, what can you tell us about Civica's vision for 2030? Thank you. Um, as you might know, the pilot phase of the European University Alliances will come to an end um, at uh, the end of this year. Um, so we are now indeed in the, uh, for the first wave of uh, alliances. Uh, so we are indeed uh, in the process of preparing the next phase. And we submitted a proposal just uh, uh, this, this week uh, for, to the European Commission. And uh, what we want to do with Civica in the near and mid future, until 2030, as you say, um, is to continue building on what we did uh, during the pilot phase. Uh, that is um, offering opportunities to our students, uh, to our researchers and to our staff, but also to society. So um, take up the role as a European University Alliance in, in the full sense for all of the communities um, to deepen our cooperations in all these fields and uh, going forward together as now 10 institutions within Civica as we have uh, two new members aboard. Um, so I think um, collectively we, we really do, do look forward to, to go ahead uh, in these next years uh, with all stakeholders uh, from the European Commission, from our national uh, sites, within our institutions and always in the interest of, of those communities, which are the students, the researchers, staff and, and society. Thank you. Mrs. Jita Ranu, you are senior manager of Civica and you are also global partnerships officer of the Central European University. Where did you study and to what extent was compatible what you have learned in Romania with your activities carried out abroad? So I, I studied philosophy at the University of Bucharest, and then I came to Central European University to do a PhD in philosophy, which I did. But uh, before that, I was many things in Romania. I was a journalist for several years. I was an editor. I worked with several publishing houses. Uh, I did uh, translations from both English and French to Romanian. So I would say that um, all these uh, skills uh, turn out to be quite transferable to what I do today. Mrs. Melanchuk, the European Union was from the very beginning a project that had two basic ideas, a Europe of nations and a Europe of regions. A Europe of nations has developed a lot, but now it seems that we are heading towards a Europe of regions. In your opinion, what uh, kind of Europe do we need now for the European Union and for Romania in particular? Well, thank you for the question. Um, this is a rather classic debate in the field of the European studies. It's uh, intergovernmentalism versus federalism. Of course, also the meaning of these two concepts uh, have, um, have evolved a lot over time, over the, la uh, the last decade. As it has also evolved the political, the institutional, the social construction of the European Union. Um, some might consider that in the light of the Ukrainian-Russian conflict that we are all living uh, nowadays, uh, we might be confronted with an um, uprise of the nationalism, uh, an uprise of the um, nation state as a key player, and thus, of course, to, uh, to sustain the uh, intergovernmental approach. Um, however, I think that it will rather be the opposite. 
because uh, European Union is now being confronted for the second time um, in the last two years with a major extreme event. The first being, of course, the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we have seen the limits of uh, acting individually as nation states. As well, we have seen afterwards the power of putting our efforts together and um, of acting in a, in a coherent manner as a whole. There's also one more thing. The debate between these two approaches should not only consider the institutional layer, the, uh, the institutions, but also the identities of the European citizens. As we know, we deal with a national identity, with a regional identity, the European, the, uh, European identity. Uh, and nowadays, we might see an uprise of the North Atlantic Alliance identity. So in my view, um, I think we, we should pay more attention uh, to the um, identity uh, feeling of the, of the citizens of the European Union, um, and afterwards also to the institutional mechanism that supports our acting together as a whole. Thank you. Yes, uh, Romania has a problem with uh, its admission in the Schengen area. Mr. Negrescu, in the context of the crisis in Ukraine, will Romania still not be admitted in the Schengen area? I think Romania has, has proved that it is capable to protect the common uh, European borders. Uh, we did a great job in doing so, and also together with, with, with different partners, stakeholders, we managed, of course, to deal, at least for the time being, in a positive terms with, with, with the refugee wave. This proves that Romania, uh, proves once more, to be very frank, that Romania is capable of, of, of being part of the Schengen area. We are today part of all the technical mechanism. Even when we register refugees, we, we, we put the data in the common Schengen database. And of course, uh, R Romania should push for the integration in the Schengen area. We have a, a Council on Justice and Home Affairs that is planned to take place in June under the French presidency, which was very much open towards uh, this process for, for Romania. And I think we have to, to, to accelerate, the, uh, let's say, uh, what we are doing in this regard. And of course, uh, if we speak about identity and feeling, uh, like it was mentioned bef before, and uh, the Europe of citizens, because I prefer this concept, I think uh, this, uh, this is something that needs to happen, because many Romanians, unfortunately, because we were not welcoming this cooperation framework, feel that they are second-ranked citizens. And this is not right. They, we are not, and uh, no one is a second-ranked uh, European citizens. We are all European citizens, and being part of the Schengen area, especially with the technical requirements being, being uh, fulfilled is absolutely necessary. And I hope that the Romanian stakeholders, Romanian institutions are going to work together with the other European partners and have that. Uh, the European Commission and the European Parliament are supporting actively this, uh, this direction. I'm also actively campaigning in this regard. I, I, I went in the Netherlands. I met a lot of decision makers from the biggest European countries that have an influence at European level. And I hope that soon this will be possible. Uh, is there a concrete date when we might enter uh, the Schengen area? I, I, I hope for a concrete date. Uh, I, I, I think the June Council is a key moment, at least to make a decision on, a, on, a, on an action plan, on a schedule to do so. Uh, I hope that the authorities that are in charge will, are going to, to, to push for that. Uh, so at the Council, we have member states. The member states decide upon that. So it's not the European Union as such. It's you member states that have to agree that. Romania has tried more than 20 times to push for a, for a vote. We decided all every time to not go till the end with the voting. I believe this is the right time to do so. I, I heard the, a lot of EU decision makers saying that uh, Romania has accomplished a lot and this should be also transferred in a concrete result in having a vote, a positive vote for this direction for Romania. Several countries opposed to the idea of Romania's admission in the Schengen area. Has anything changed? In the meantime, uh, I, I think the current context is quite different on, on, on all means and on all subjects. Uh, we live in a new world today after uh, the Russian uh, military and aggressive intervention in Ukraine. Things have changed. 
at least this is how I perceive things. Things have changed because now we understand that uh, security is, is not guaranteed for everyone, and we know the importance of the union, and we know how important it is for everyone to feel part of this union. For us, to feel part of the union entirely means also to be part of the Schengen area. So, uh, uh, of course, not all countries have the same feeling, to be very frank, after visiting many member states, but it's up to us also to take a leading role. So I, I called upon national institutions in Romania, but also European institutions supporting us to, 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 to do this push till the end and have uh, the approval of the accession uh, as soon as possible. The war in Ukraine showed us that the Green Deal plan is no longer sustainable. Romania has shut down its coal-based power capacity. Mrs. Melenchuk, when will coal-fired power plants and coal mines reopen? You know, this is a question that uh, I think it would be difficult to, to answer even for the, the decision makers nowadays. Um, please recall that um, many have also said the Green Deal is not feasible uh, anymore, it's not uh, sustainable uh, anymore at the beginning of the pandemic. As, of course, at that moment, the priorities changed, um, the, the health uh, security became uh, the, the most important priority, as well as the economic sustainability that also came in the foreground. Um, however, the EU strengthened its commitment to the objectives set in the Green Deal. Maybe we shouldn't rush, considering that the Green Deal is no longer feasible. Uh, an extreme event, as it is the conflict in Ukraine, may also be an incredible trigger for uh, the European Union to gain its um, independence in terms of uh, uh, energetic, of course, uh, independence to Russia. This doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it shall happen through coal-fired power plants. There are more solutions that are on the table at this point. Um, considering biofossils on the long term, of course, it, it's one thing. And maybe also um, different suppliers on the short term. Now, let's discuss a little bit about the French presidency of uh, the Council of the European Union. Mr. Stadelmeier, Sciences Po is a learning lab which provides ideas and solutions for the French, French presidency proposals for the political presidency of France in the European Union. What are the objectives of France for its presidency of the Council of the European Union? Uh, well, um, I, I cannot speak for the French government. Um, but as you know, the, the French uh, presidency is quite active in uh, giving force and initiative to the European Union uh, during these six months. And of course, the circumstances are sadly so quite uh, exceptional. Um, as consultants, what I can... how do you see uh, this aspect of the French presidency of the Council of the European Union? Well, um, <laughs> uh, w what we can see, I could say personally, seems to be a good leadership from the French government in the sense uh, uh, where the European Union um, is giving this role to a member state during a certain uh, time. Um, from an institutional uh, viewpoint, what I can say is that Sciences Po, of course, is a place for debate. So for an example, for example, we welcomed just in the beginning of the week, uh, French uh, Secretaire d'État Clément Beaune, who was responsible for European affairs in the French government at Sciences Po to speak with our students and to discuss the current situation in Europe. Of course, discussions were much driven uh, uh, to, to the Ukrainian war, to, to the situation in, in Ukraine and the war. Um, so this is, um, this is uh, what we, what we do uh, at Sciences Po to give an uh, auditorium and a place for, for debate uh, for the decision makers and, of course, for our students. Um, in terms of Civica, uh, what I, I could or I would like to stress is that we have been very active with uh, students from all over Civica institutions uh, in the beginning of this month uh, in the um, context of a newly designed European Student Assembly. 
uh, where uh, Victor Negrescu was had had the um, uh, uh, had the um, pleasure to, to to intervene also, and we I would like to thank him again for that. Um, this newly designed European Student Assembly um, is oriented to students of European University Alliances. And these students, Civica and others, have developed policy pro proposals on different policy fields, uh, which will be elementing the um, uh, conference on the future of Europe. So this is another example where we as Sciences Po and as Civica, uh, in a wider sense, we contribute with our students and uh, uh, to uh, European participative processes and give voice to, to our communities and namely our students. Mr. Negrescu, uh, in your opinion, what are the main aspects of the rotating presidency of France in the Council of the European Union? I think uh, France is doing a great job, actually, uh, of course, in these difficult times. Uh, they started the presidency with, with a couple of key priorities. Of course, they have changed a little bit, but I want to uh, uh, emphasize a couple of them that are important currently. So, of course, strategic auto autonomy, in my opinion, is one of the key directions given by the French presidency, which is quite, quite relevant today. It means to be uh, independent as much as possible at European level. Uh, that means independent also from, from the uh, energy resources coming from the Russian Federation, uh, investing more in, in the digital transformation, investing more in education, investing more in, in, in how we are producing and what we are producing at European level, wi while engaging again with our external partners. And I think this is one of the key directions. Secondly, uh, they promoted a lot this feeling of belonging. And to be very frank, uh, France was the initiator of, of the European Universities Network, uh, which proved to be a, a, a very positive and concrete, let's say, uh, uh, way of, of, of building this feeling of belonging. So at the beginning, not all member states were sharing this point of view. Also myself, also uh, in the European Parliament, myself, I was confronted with people that were not really open and, and supporting this idea. But little by little, people understood that this was the way to go. And now we have more and more call for tenders to, to, to improve those networks, develop why not networks at high school level also that are similar to the university networks. This is also called upon in the framework of the Conference of the Future of Europe. The first point in the conclusion that were discussed actually today, this morning before I came to the meeting, was the need to harmonize the cooperation on, on education, on culture, on everything that is related to our identity and our feeling of belonging, related to our way of life, which is again, part and, and very much linked with uh, how, uh, and, uh, how we are looking at, at our democracies, our, 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 our development models. So this is, I think, one of the strong points of, of the French presidency. They still have a couple of months to go. It, it, there will not be easy times, but we also need to prepare for the upcoming one. Uh, the, uh, so therefore, of course, it's important again to, to, to keep united. I think the feeling of unity is essential in, in, in the weeks and months to come. And uh, about the political situation in France, uh, what are uh, Emmanuel Macron's chances in the presidential election in April? So it, it, it is clear that the, the, the crisis in Ukraine has changed the political landscape everywhere. So people are looking for stability, are looking for confirmed leaders. So, of course, I'm not here to, 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 to make uh, political evaluations, but yeah, the French presidency, uh, president right now uh, is first in the polls, uh, probably also because of his uh, European leadership. And this proves once more that, uh, you know, uh, European citizens or French citizens, Romanian citizens, really want to see in their leaders this capacity to, to engage at European and international level. And I think this is a, a change in the mentality because for many, let's say, years, people were, were searching for leaders that were close to the local roots, local level. But now there is a, a change of perspective, and this is good because the European level, uh, the NATO structure also, uh, have an influence on, our, on what is happening in our own countries. And it's important that this, uh, this uh, uh, type of competence and skills have been rediscovered by French citizens, but also by all European citizens as such. I would like now us to return to Civica. Mrs. Gitaranu, what makes Civica different from the other partnerships under your purview? I'm asking you this because you know Forms Without Structure is uh, a Romanian brain based on a theory developed by Tito Maiorescu, formerly for a fund in Romanian. Thank you. I take these to be actually two questions. Uh, one uh, about uh, how is Civica different from other forms of partnerships? And the other one, how uh, does Civica fare when confronted with uh, Maiorescu's critique? I'll try to give uh, an answer 
to each of them. So um, regarding the how Civica compares to, to other uh, forms of partnerships, let's not forget that uh, academic uh, cooperation partnerships usually concentrate on um, a few specific activities uh, regarding teaching, uh, learning and research. And we're talking about mobilities for students, for faculty and for administrative staff and uh, research projects. Civica has all these uh, and a lot more. First of all, let's not forget that Civica is an alliance of uh, eight European universities. In total, uh, we have around 50,000 students at all levels of instructions, BA, Masters and uh, PhD, and around 10,000 um, faculty and administrative staff. And let's uh, have a look. Uh, I will give you a few numbers and some data so that you can judge for yourselves how, uh, how uh, uh, different Civica is from regular uh, partnerships. Two years and a half into the uh, pilot project, for uh, BA students, uh, the offer um, uh, totals, among other things, 43 courses which the students, these courses are offered across the Alliance. Uh, any BA student can take any two such courses um, and uh, add a participation to a um, European week, which is a special event organized in summer and um, completion of a um, capstone project. And for this, the student can get a uh, certificate, particularly designed for this program, which is called Engaged to signal the fact that all these courses uh, are very interdisciplinary, but have a very strong uh, civic engagement component. And there are several other initiatives at the BA level. At the master level, uh, let's just mention um, six uh, joint courses, uh, which have been um, designed jointly by pairs of faculty from any two Civica partners, and then taught jointly to the respective students. And then perhaps the um, jewel of the crown, so to speak, the multi-campus course, which is a course that was designed by a team of uh, faculty from all eight partners and was taught simultaneously in the fall term to students from uh, across Civica. You can only imagine the, the, the amount of um, logistic uh, uh, challenges that the course posed. It was very successful and is going to be reoffered. Then let's see, for uh, PhD students, um, we have a platform that was established nearly one year ago, where all partners offer uh, courses for uh, uh, the PhDs across Civica. I counted yesterday a bit more than 200 courses in one calendaristic year. And we're talking about all sorts of uh, uh, courses, academic ones, um, skill building, uh, workshops, research methods, workshops, everything. And then the PhDs have chances to go to summer schools organized for them within Civica, to attend uh, academic conferences. We have also a PhD lab, a PhD clinic, where they can find extra supervision, can find advice and talk to their peers. Now, probably one of the most ambitious thing that we set up to do uh, is uh, concerning research. And we are trying to develop a uh, common uh, research environment um, along four major themes, uh, which are uh, the future of Europe, um, crisis of Earth, uh, data science for social sciences, uh, and the societies in transition. And let me give you an idea of what output uh, we have so far from uh, all the uh, consultations that took place across our campuses. So in uh, two years and a half, we had two calls for research proposals for PhDs, for uh, postdocs and uh, researchers and faculty. That, uh, uh, so one ended in May 2021 with 11 projects selected out of 27 uh, outstanding submissions. And uh, a few weeks ago, the second call ended um, with another six collaborative projects being selected. They cover a broad range of, uh, of disciplines. Uh, and um, um, the, the decision to participate uh, to these calls uh, came basically from uh, 
the desire of our uh, researchers to do things together. The, Thank you. We are we'll talking be back about to the... this topic. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Jitareanu. Now I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Melenchuk, uh, you worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You've had work experience in Central America and South America. Why doesn't Romania diversify its bilateral and political relations with these two areas? Because uh, these relations could later become some very important economic relations, after all. Well, um, first of all, I should say that my uh, work in the Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, had nothing to do with uh, Latin America and uh, Central America. Uh, but it is true that I did have some uh, lecturing experiences in, uh, in the aforementioned uh, regions. Um, however, I wouldn't rush to say that uh, Romania does not have uh, a proper uh, bilateral and uh, political relations with uh, these two areas. Um, maybe it is true that there is not sufficient public uh, awareness about the bilateral cooperation. There are many examples that can be given. There are um, projects, initiatives that are financed, for example, uh, and developed through the Romanian Agency for uh, International Aid. Um, as well as there are, uh, there is an academic cooperation that is quite strong. Um, and we have such cooperation at the highest level with states from uh, Latin America and uh, the Caribbean. For example, the director of uh, CNSPA, the, the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration, uh, is also the president of the Foro Academico Permanente uh, de America Latina, the, the academic uh, permanent forum for uh, uh, the relationship that deals with the relationship between Latin America and the Caribbean and the European Union. So there are many such examples of uh, bilateral cooperation or uh, uh, regional to uh, nation cooperation that maybe uh, are not very uh, well known to the general public, but uh, I think that the, the, the bilateral cooperation between the two regions uh, is taken into consideration uh, also, about, uh, also by, by Romania. Yes, Mr. Negrescu, now I would like to discuss with you about the Recovery and Resilience Facility. How do other countries from Europe implement uh, this facility and how does Romania relate to the other EU member states? The Recovery and Resilience Facility is a very important mechanism to support, again, the European Union to, 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 to recover after the pandemic. And Romania, of course, uh, has uh, a lot of funds being allocated to it uh, to do so. Of course, um, um, there are some good things in the recovery plan and something that might need, to, of course, to be amended in negotiation with the Commission. What is good is that we have uh, a significant allocation for education, something that was called upon by the European Parliament. Uh, I initiated this process in the European Parliament requesting to member states to allocate at least 10% for education to the recovery, uh, in the recovery and resilience plans. And it, happens, uh, it happened, of course, in the case of the Romanian plan. So, of course, uh, the, the funds should, should build, let's say, uh, the, the structure for the long-term development of each country. What has not, unfortunately, been achieved in the recovery plans is to have a European dimension. So, the Romanian plan is not linked with the Bulgarian plan. The Italian plan is not linked with the French plan. And this is quite unfortunate because, of course, we, we need to get out of the situation also a national level, but it's impossible to do so in a system where we depend on each other. So I think this is something that needs to be improved. In the same time, the social dimension of the plans needs to be improved as well. There are not of, uh, a lot of sometimes reforms or requirements that imply uh, to, to, to limit social benefits, uh, to reduce the right to pension, to reduce, again, access to free education and free health care in, in a large dimension. So those elements need to be improved. Uh, the Parliament is monitoring the process. We call upon the Commission to do so. There are, there are several commissioners that are going to come to Romania next week uh, to discuss those matters with us, which is good, which is positive, and we hope, of course, in, a, in, a, in, in being capable, and this is, I think, the goal of everything, to implement those projects and to attract those funds, because we speak about billions of euros, 
uh, being allocated to each member state and we need that money to recover. We need resources to deal with the current challenges also uh, raised by the Ukrainian uh, situation. You are also very interested in uh, digital education. How do you see the digitalization of uh, the Romanian education system? So indeed, in, in the pandemic, we, we, we had to immediately move to the digital for, uh, version of, of, of what we, we did before. Uh, but in, in some cases, the process was not, was not successful in terms of quality of the process. Uh, and, you know, some people uh, believe that what happened is digital education. No, we only had online education. Digital education means a lot more than that. In the European Parliament, we drafted a report uh, precisely defining all of that. What we mean by quality digital education. What are the methods? What are the means? What is the infrastructure that we need? How to avoid having kids and students not being connected? How we support teachers in this regard? How we engage with, with parents in the process? And, and local stakeholders. So, of course, it's a process that has started, but that needs to be improved quite fast. This is why, uh, with, uh, under the pressure of the European Parliament, uh, the Commission launched the Digital Education Stakeholders Forum. It, the meeting took place, the first meeting took place this week. Uh, I attended the meeting to try to identify how we can improve that across Europe, uh, in all countries, in all regions, in rural areas also as well. And of course, this needs to happen again for, 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 for all types of education, also at university level. And of course, I acknowledge the fact that the, uh, in the European universities network, they do a lot of work also in digitizing uh, the process. Uh, and of course, digital is part of our life. This is not there to replace what we are doing. It, it, we, we certainly learned that it's not replacing in-person learning, but we need, of course, to integrate, uh, again, technologies, digital means in what we are doing in our daily lives and also in education in a positive, constructive and in a way that at the end generates positive and, uh, and, and constructive results for everyone. Now let's, uh, let us return a little bit to Civica. Mr. Stadelmeier, at the moment Civica is an alliance of European universities uh, from several countries. Will Civica become an independent university which uh, will have each university as a branch of this larger university? That's an interesting question, and it's uh, in the long run hard to say how everything will develop. It depends on many externalities. Um, you know, we like incrementalism in Europe. Um, as of now, of course, we, we work and function as an alliance um, along the lines which, which Monica has, has told you about in detail, which, uh, which is great. And uh, so you, you will have seen by what Monica said that we really are integrating in all the fields of our activities. And again, um, in the macro terms, that is education, research, um, and outreach to society, the, the three missions of university. We are active as Civica and all of them. So it is uh, an all uh, over project for our institutions. Um, forever, uh, however, for the time being, um, Civica, as such, does not have a legal entity. It's the member institutions uh, which have a legal status. Um, so at this time, it's probably too early to, to think um, about those questions really uh, so far ahead. Um, but um, let, let me say, uh, ask me again in 20 years. and. Uh, we know that things uh, might might develop, and the uh, European Commission and the stakeholders are um, are working in, in certain directions, which might not lead to complete integration, even in, th in twenty time in twenty years time. But um, uh, of course, it's it's an incre incremental process for the time being. The sovereignty clearly is with the member institutions. Um, but yeah, from a personal viewpoint, I think it's a very exciting situation uh, where we uh, uh, are sub submitted in a way to, to, to general dynamics we, we observe in Europe between sovereignty and integration and so on and so forth. Um, we now have uh, not even three years of existence. And um, yeah, the long run will, will, will tell us about that, I think. Yeah. Do you know why uh, ENA no longer exists? École Nationale d'Administration? Ena. Ah, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, the uh, well, Ena was um, uh, is now, uh, so to speak, uh, replaced by uh, a new body, which is the ENSP, 
and here in France, the yeah, Institut National du Service Public. So uh, the uh, the training of uh, high level uh, civil servants have indeed has indeed be, uh, been modernized and uh, overhauled, uh, which meant uh, uh, to create a new body, which is uh, the Institut National du, du Service Public, which uh, in a way uh, will take up uh, or is now taking up uh, a certain number of uh, missions which INA had been securing uh, until recently. Mrs. Jitoreanu, uh, taking into consideration your expertise, what is the difference between the Romanian and the European education systems? Well, I can only give some of my personal opinions, which are not based on a scientific study. Um, I, would, uh, I would say that I think um, education and uh, higher education in Romania developed a lot uh, in the last two decades. But I would say that, um, for instance, um, there is still a lot to be done in terms of uh, uh, professionalizing uh, the um, administrative staff of universities. And I'm referring here to um, universities having uh, proper admissions um, offices, career offices, um, and um, alumni, and all sorts of, uh, of other uh, um, offices and facilities that um, help students um, in their studies and uh, further on afterwards. And uh, regarding the uh, process of learning, I think um, it, uh, it would be great to see more uh, critical thinking being incorporated into the way uh, most, uh, if uh, preferably all disciplines are being taught, because this would in really increase um, the, um, the level of preparedness of the students and also um, uh, it would uh, encourage them to, to think critically and uh, be open to free inquiry. And also perhaps uh, last but not least, uh, more in the terms of educating them for, uh, uh, in terms of research ethics and academic conduct. So what is plagiarism? Um, how important it is uh, to um, keep to, to certain uh, principles of uh, good conduct, which are relevant uh, not only in academia, but uh, outside of it as well. But as I said, these are just a few of my personal opinions. Now, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Melenchuk, what are the programs that support young people who want to open a business, to become entrepreneurs? Well, um, there are many uh, programs that support uh, entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurship in Romania, uh, depending on the sector of activity. Um, I think I, I will only refer to one example um that in our that that is available in our university um we have launched a project that is called uh, kickstart student of course it is financed through um uh, european financed uh, program um so this kickstart student will lead to the financing of no less than 26 um, initiatives business initiatives 13 of them will be granted uh, 60,000 euros and uh, 13, the other 13 shall be granted uh, 40,000 euros. This is just an example. Uh, there are many universities that uh, applied to the same uh, financing uh, uh, grants. So uh, many other students in Romania have this opportunity and uh, I hope they will um, take advantage of this opportunity. Mr. Negrescu, uh, speaking about uh, this uh, situation with the uh, young people who are considered the future of the EU, what are the plans of the European Union uh, in this matter? You took part in a debate on this topic. So, all Europeans are the future of the EU, of course, but young people, of course, have, have engaged a lot uh, at, at the last European elections, and they have uh, proved to be, of course, very much committed Europeans. Uh, at European level, we have, again, this wonderful program, which is the Erasmus, the Erasmus Plus program, which is supporting young people and initiatives uh, of young people. 
So, of course, it means uh, organized structures, uh, NGOs uh, supporting them, but also that means uh, schools, that means universities, but that also young people simply together they can put up a project without, you know, formally, uh, forming a, a legal structure. So, um, uh, the European Parliament has called for the increase of the budgeting for the Erasmus program. We managed to achieve that. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities for them linked to entrepreneurship, linked to uh, education, linked to non-formal uh, training, linked to digital education, linked to doing projects to protect the environment. So there are many interesting uh, uh, dimensions uh, of, of all of that. But what is clear is that we can, when we need to find ways to move ahead. So today, uh, in the panel of the Conference for the Future of Europe, dedicated to education and youth, uh, citizens that have been consulted by the conference presented a couple of killer proposals. Among those proposals, we had uh, the possibility of, of young people and even children to engage uh, in the European decision-making process, uh, giving them a platform, for instance, to uh, for mobilities, uh, to identify job opportunities in different countries, uh, having uh, the possibility to have uh, training, digital training, language training, and all of those elements. So uh, I think we have to move ahead. Uh, and, 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 and the Europe of today uh, will, will lead us to the Europe of the future. And of course, young people and all European citizens ha have and should have their, 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 the possibility to, uh, to say what they want. We only have a few minutes left and I would like to ask Mr. Stadelmeier. An important topic uh, to Civica is Europe Revisited. On the Civica website, it is mentioned that, quote, Civica embodies the European idea in its purest form united in diversity, unquote. From your perspective, Mr. Stadelmeier, what will remain the same and what will change for post-pandemic Europe? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Indeed, uh, the motto of the European Union, united in diversity, very much also applies to, to Civica. So we are all different as institutions coming to Civica. We are eight now, but will be 10 in the next phase from, from autumn onwards. And um, it's, um, it's great work. Uh, I think we are experiencing to come together with this diversity from different places of Europe, but also as institutions being, being different and work together for, um, in the end, uh, European common good and uh, understanding uh, across borders in Europe between our students, between our staff members, between researchers, of course, they are already very much used to that. Um, and uh, with regard to the post-pandemic world, um, yes, um, we will continue to, to meet and work together distantly, uh, like we actually do, do right now in a, in a way, uh, through internet-based uh, video tools. And uh, this will not go away, and this is very uh, helpful for us because it lets us work together on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, very effectively. So this is something that will stay. Uh, we have developed, all of us, of course, developed this during the pandemic. Um, and this is a, a good thing too, which we have developed and uh, we are experiencing and using. We will continue. And, um, and it also means marvelous opportunities for our students, by the way, as it um, lets them um, follow education distantly. For example, within Civica, we, we have those joint courses, multi-campus courses, which Monica mentioned, where students from different places uh, within Civica from Europe will connect and will be taught by teachers dis distantly um, from different uh, member universities. So this is very concrete and very, very exciting for our students uh, as something that has now come up with these internet-based video conferencing. Thank you, tools. Mr. Stadelmeier. Maybe we will meet uh, in 20 years and we will discuss also <laughs> about your answer to the previous question. Now, Yes, it would be a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Negrescu, one final question. What are the challenges to democracy in the 21st century that you see in democratic states and how can the European Union help them overcome these challenges? I think uh, we have to re reinforce our democracies. Uh, this is what characterizes uh, the, the, the Western bloc and also transatlantic relations. So, of course, this means to invest more in education, in civic education in particular. We need to, to teach people and, and inform them about their rights, about their obligations, about our system, about how they can participate. Uh, democracy uh, proved once more to be a successful model, and, 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 and we need to reinforce that. 
the local, the regional, the national and European dimension. Universities can contribute to that, you can contribute to that as well as a journalist. The media do a great job in this regard. Social media also can help if managed correctly. So I think that there are a lot of things to be done and, I, and, and I'm, I'm confident that in the current context people understood the power and the significance of democracy. It pushes Ukrainians to fight for their freedom and of course it should push us in trying to do more, improve our system while in the same time protecting our values. And that concludes our show for today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your presence on this program today. It was a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching us. As you already know, the videos of Observers of the European Parliament are available exclusively online on the Facebook page of TVR1, the YouTube channel of TVR, the Instagram account of TVR1 and on the TVR Plus platform. I'm Monica Elieprika. Thank you for watching us and have a nice weekend. See you in April.